Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today is June 23rd, 2020, and I'm speaking with Rana Hogarth, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Thank you for joining us, Rana. Thank you for having me. You have studied the medical and scientific construction of race in America in the 18th and 19th centuries. When did people in America start engaging in a science about innate differences in the bodies of black and white people? So a really great question. I think based on my own research and what I have found in the archives, we can really start to see scientists or physicians or perhaps even maybe elite and learned men digging into questions of difference probably around the middle of the 18th century, where you maybe start to see a treatise or a report published on skin color or observations on disease and then observations specifically on what types of people are getting sick and what types of people are not. And from there, I think we can start to see more work, a sort of a flourishing of questions about, hey, why are we noticing these differences between groups of people? And here, you know, thinking about colonial America, the Americas more broadly, you're looking at indigenous populations, you're looking at Europeans, you're looking at, of course, Africans naturally coming in as slaves during this era. So what you're actually seeing here is a confluence of sort of settler colonialism, sort of displacement of indigenous bodies, but also the bringing in of captive African bodies, which creates this moment where people can start to ask questions about racial difference and record them in a more systematic way. Have medical discussions of innate racial difference been limited to overt forms of racism, such as defenses of slavery? Well, actually, perhaps one of the most interesting findings for me in my research has been the use of ideologies of difference that were actually proposed by people who were opposed to slavery. In fact, Creating this notion of difference or constructing this idea that there is innate difference between blacks and whites can come from a variety of different people, regardless of their view on slavery. Benjamin Rush is a really good example of this, and I talk about him at length in my own book, Medicalizing Blackness. Rush, who was very much opposed to slavery, was one of the proponents of suggesting that black people were physiologically different from white people. And he did not come up with this because he wanted to defend slavery at all. This was something that he noted, one, during the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, which took place in 1793. He observed, he thought that black people did not seem to get yellow fever and thought that they were racially immune. He later amended this view and said that, well, they probably don't suffer as badly as whites. So here is a figure, a very well-known figure in American medicine, also an anti-slavery activist, who did believe in innate differences and actually helped to propagate what I think are some very damaging ideas, particularly about Black people not being susceptible to yellow fever and also Black people having an ability to withstand pain more so than whites, which is something he does actually repeat, something he hears from another physician and repeats in his own work at the time. How have the notions and language of medicalizing race spread beyond the professional medical and scientific communities? So again, a really great question and something that I grapple with myself as a historian to think about, okay, I've looked at these medical texts, these older historical texts, so what does this mean for day-to-day -day life now? And what I have actually found is that I hear people say, maybe casually or in passing, Things like sickle cell anemia, for example, as being a so-called black disease, right? And the idea of that even coming together, right, a black disease, and to highlight something like sickle cell anemia, which we know is an inherited genetic disorder, to me, I am most certainly seeing blackness being medicalized or being deployed as a way to distinguish, right, who can suffer from this and to kind of mark that as difference, even today, by not necessarily physicians or the assumption, for example, that people will say, oh, well, we all look different. And clearly, there must be something different about us. We can't all be the same. And you kind of have to say, well, sure, I'm not saying that, you know, everybody has the same genetic makeup. Sure, there's differences. But are those differences due to the thing we called race? And I think that I do hear 
a lot lately, people using race in sort of a medical context as if it is a medical characteristic. And I don't think that that has dropped away at all. In fact, I seem to hear it even more nowadays, to be honest. Can you recount for us the efforts to counter the mainstream views of medicalizing race? How have Black Americans or Indigenous Americans resisted the notions coming from people like Benjamin Rush or or afterwards? That's a great question as well. I I appreciate that simply because this was a dialogue back and forth. It's very easy for us to say we have a published paper trail Uh, written records from white physicians that will say these are the things we think about Black people's bodies or Indigenous people's bodies. What I found in researching the first book was that African Americans did try to push back against some of these very damaging ideas. And specifically to the point of Benjamin Rush, during the yellow fever epidemic of 1793, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, two African American ministers, they were free, they lived in Philadelphia and actually were on friendly terms with Rush, They actually published their own account of what happened during the yellow fever epidemic. And in it, they actually say, you know, we were told by physicians and by other observers that African-Americans, that our people would not get this dreaded disease. And we wish that would have been the case because that's not what happened at all. And I will say, Benjamin Rush actually notes in a letter, I believe he writes to his wife, that Richard Allen falls ill with yellow fever. So this is sort of a moment in which you have African Americans in the written record saying, we were told this by these medical authorities, and that was not our experience during the yellow fever epidemic. And then you have Benjamin Rush, one of the key proponents of this idea, admitting privately, oh, it turns out that was wrong. And one of the champions of the free African American community actually came down with yellow fever. There are numerous cases where you have Black physicians, and this is maybe looking much later, looking forward. So James McCune Smith, other African-American practitioners who would say, look, this idea of an innate difference is not true. It's not there. And he's trying to do that as a practitioner himself. You have cases where the question is raised, on what basis do we have of this innate difference? Because this is something that is debated back and forth. And so I think it's hard to get the written record from African Americans and other marginalized groups in the 18th century. There there are not that many sources. But when you do find them, you can see that there is a back and forth. And I would actually also argue that looking between the lines of some of the things written by white physicians also allows us to kind of glimpse the perspectives or the resistance of African American groups to these kind of blanket ideas about racial difference. I can unfortunately mostly speak to the cases of African Americans, less so for indigenous Americans in terms of how they might have pushed back. I do know, for example, in terms of medical knowledge production, indigenous practitioners would have been very resistant to necessarily sharing that knowledge with white practitioners in terms of botanic therapies, etc. So I do get a sense that there is even that back and forth that exists. It's just I myself have not studied it as length as I have with African Americans. So you've given us an overview of the history of medicalizing race, medicalizing blackness in early America. Do you see contemporary echoes of the history you've been telling us about? Yes. <laughs> yes, I have. And, and it has actually come about in a very strange way. I want to kind of just focus on this specific moment that we find ourselves in during this COVID-19 pandemic. I should say very early on in the days of the pandemic, probably like February, March, there were some murmurings, rumors that African Americans were not going to get this disease, right? This was something that I was actually queried. Somebody had asked, what do you make of these comments on social media that, oh, this isn't a disease that's impacting Black people or Africa, right? The whole continent is not having as many cases. Clearly, this is not a concern. And now look where we are, where in the United States, at least, we can say we have disproportionate rates of African Americans, Latinx, Indigenous Americans who are coming down with this COVID-19. So for me, I've seen this narrative of saying this whole group, right, blanket group, doesn't seem to get this disease to now why does this group seem to disproportionately get this disease? And for me, I've kind of seen this as the danger of, in the first case, making blanket assumptions of saying that it's something about the race of people 
which is always a dangerous thing. But then to say, okay, if there's disproportionate rates amongst African Americans, I would say, again, don't look at it as the race. Look at these structural and external factors that could possibly contribute to them getting the disease. And so I think, you know, I'm in Illinois. In Chicago, I've been pretty hard hit. And in Chicago, we do have very clear cases of African Americans having disproportionately higher cases and mortality for COVID-19. I would caution people to say, don't assume that it's something about them being Black or that they are Black that this is happening. I would say, what is it like to be an African American living in Chicago? What might an African American's experience be with the healthcare system? What might their experience be with systemic racism, lack of access to care, the external environment in which they live, hostility within the medical profession? So I'm talking about overt racism and discrimination in the medical setting, comorbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension, which again, I think have links to structural external factors that contribute to those comorbid conditions. So for me, I say, resist the temptation to use race as the explanatory factor and instead ask, how might that person be treated differently because of their race? And how might that contribute to negative health outcomes? Rana, thank you very much for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.